All right. Okay, thank you everybody for joining us today um, for our monthly citizen science lecture. Uh, my name is Ramya. I'm the citizen science coordinator for the Key Biscayne Community Foundation. Um, we have with us today Brianna Gibbs, who uh, works with me also in this with the citizen science project. Um, we'll both be uh, sort of your hosts today. Um, as Bree mentioned earlier, um, any questions that come up during the lecture, we're not going to stop during the lecture. Um, but at the end, we'll answer um, any questions you have. And our chat feature is turned off, um, but you can send questions to me by email at uh, Ramya at Kibiskein, Ramya at KeyScience.org, and I will be checking that throughout the lecture. Um, or you can uh, tweet us at, uh, at KBSitSci, and uh, Brianna will be uh, monitoring our Twitter account to see any questions that you guys uh, send to us. Um, just a few logistical things. Uh, we're going to keep everybody muted and keep everybody's video off during the lecture. And that just helps kind of with the video stream quality um, when there's too many videos on and too many people with that aren't muted. Um, it can sometimes get choppy. Um, if you want to be notified of future lectures or receive our quarterly newsletter, um, just send me an email at ramya at keyscience.org and just uh, tell me your name and put newsletter in the uh, subject and I will add you to our mailing list. Um, so with that, um, oh, one other thing. Today is Give Miami Day, as I'm sure uh, many of you have heard. It's a day for the Miami Foundation to have a huge sort of giving, uh, like give-a-thon essentially. And they allow 900 uh, nonprofits in the local Miami area to join. And basically, um, everybody, it's for you know our supporters and any philanthropic individuals that want to support their nonprofits and the work that they do. Um, so if you would like to support us, we would really appreciate it. Um, at the end of the lecture, we'll give you the website where you can go to um, support us for Give Miami Day. And that just helps us, uh, you know, keep getting um, new and better lectures and expand our programming with the key science or anything else. Um, it's a little difficult right now with COVID, but we have a lot of plans for, for different citizen science activities that we can do on the key. So with that, um, we'll just get right into it. Uh, today we have with us Jordan Holder. Um, he is a graduate of the University of Miami. Um, he holds a master's of professional science from University of Miami. That's actually, uh, he and I uh, went to University, University of Miami together. And he has also worked for our citizen science program. Um, and he's gonna talk to us today about um, the effects of Hurricane Irma on Biscayne Bay and what they've been doing to uh, sort of uh, remediate the, um, the issues that were caused. So with that, Jordan, I will hand it off to you. Sounds good. All right, everybody, can you see me or not? Are we, do I need to open this thumbnail thing or are we good? Uh, no, you should, you should be good. Okay, awesome, cool. All right, so how's it going everybody? Uh, just like Ramya said, my name's Jordan and I am currently a biological science technician at Biscayne National Park. And today I'm gonna be talking to you guys about a project that I'm working on with my team in order to restore some of the natural resources in the park from the effects of Hurricane Irma. And then in the process, hopefully shed some light on some of the larger issues that are facing the marine ecosystems in the park. So without further ado, let's get going. So first I'll talk a little bit about the park, Biscayne National Park. So Biscayne National Park wasn't always Biscayne National Park. It actually used to be Biscayne National Monument and it was designated that in 1968. And it wasn't until 1980 that it became a park and was expanded. And so you can see that the park now stretches all the way north to just south of Key Biscayne. Um, it encompasses Stiltsville. There's this whole safety valve area up here that's now encompassed uh, some seagrass meadows, Bowie Rocks, and then it stretches all the way south to just near Key Largo, actually past Key Largo here out on the reef. And it's the largest marine park in the national park system. It's comprised of about 95% water. And for that reason, it's mainly accessed by boaters. 
And we have down here, you can see where the star is. This is our visitor center. It's in Homestead. Um, but like I said, because of the fact that it is mainly water, it's mainly accessed by boaters. And then for that reason, a lot of people don't know it's a national park. They don't even know they're in a national park. There are signs in the water marking that you are entering a national park, but they're kind of few and far between. So again, a lot of people don't even know it's a national park. When I mention Biscayne, a lot of people think I'm talking about Bill Baggs actually on Key Biscayne. So now you know. So I'll talk a little bit about the cultural resources we have in the park. I actually don't work in the cultural resource management division, um, so I'm not super well versed in it, but just to give you guys uh, some information on that. So we have a number of shipwrecks in the park and some of them are located on what's called our Maritime Heritage Trail. And I kind of like to think of this as a replacement for what you would have in a normal national park, which is a hiking trail. Um, so this trail actually includes six shipwrecks and then it actually includes Fowey Rocks as well, um, where there's mooring buoys that you can dive and snorkel. And again, I like to say that it replaces the hiking trails because we only have one true hiking trail in the park and that is Spite Highway on Elliott Key. There's also evidence of historic people and homesteads. So down here, we can see a picture of the Jones family. Um, a member of the Jones family back in the day purchased some land or purchased land on some of the keys in the Southern end of the park for $300. And then eventually when the park was created, they, the family was able to sell that land for over a million dollars. So pretty good investment there. There are, of course, archaeological sites in the park. Here we can see one on a shipwreck. And then, of course, there's Stiltsville, too. Um, I'm sure some of you folks know a lot more about Stiltsville than I do. Um, I know it was built back in the 30s by Eddie Crawfish Walker uh, at its height in the 60s. I think there were about 20-plus uh, structures. And then as of 2012, that was down to seven. And it was actually incorporated to the park in 1985. So now I'll talk more about the natural resources in the park, something I do know more about because I actually work in the natural resource management division. So Biscayne protects a rare combination of seagrass meadows. So there are a number scattered about the offshore areas throughout the bay, mangrove forests. So Biscayne protects one of the longest continuous stretches of mangrove, mangrove forests left on Florida's East Coast. And then, of course, the beautiful coral reefs. So, like I said, I work in the Natural Resource Management Division. And so that division is further broken down into two programs. So, just like it says, we manage the natural resources in the park. And just as it sounds, the Fish and Wildlife Inventory Monitoring Program, they monitor and inventory all sorts of different species of animals and uh, plants that live in the park, things like that. And so some of their activities include conducting creel surveys, so asking fishermen about their catch, sea turtle nest monitoring. Uh, we do have some beaches in the park, they're few and far between, but we do get some sea turtles nesting. Um, these beaches are primarily on LA Key, so they go out and monitor those nests, inventory them as well. Reef and fish surveys, so these folks will go down and survey the populations of fish that are on the reef. They will also survey the benthic organisms or organisms that live on, near, or at the bottom. Um, so for example, a coral would be an example of a benthic organism that they survey. Wildlife rescue, so we occasionally get things like birds with fishing gear stuck in their mouths in the park or sea turtles that get hit by boats, unfortunately, and these folks will rescue them and then take them to more advanced care if needed. And they also do some invasive species control. So here at the top, we can see a Burmese python. We do get some of those in the park. They've actually swam out pretty far into the bay. And so these folks will capture them and then euthanize them. And then here on the bottom, we have the Indo-Pacific lionfish, which is an invasive predatory fish that is native to the Indo-Pacific region. It's a voracious predator that eats a lot of the native fish. And so these folks will go out and spear these lionfish to try to keep their populations at bay. 
And then there's the second program that is under the Natural Resource Management Division, and that is the Habitat Restoration Program. And that is actually the program that I work under and my team works under. So again, the Habitat Restoration Program, we do pretty much what it sounds like we do. We're focused on the restoration of those three main ecosystems that you can find in the park, the seagrass meadows, coastal forests, or mangrove forests, and coral reefs. And again, this is the, um, the program under which my team falls. So as a whole, the division goes out after man-made disturbances, so groundings and things like that, or natural disturbances such as Hurricane Irma, assess the damage, determine if restoration needs to be done, determine if it does, what restoration techniques need to be done, things like that. So again, I said uh, the Irma restoration team, the team that I'm on is under the Habitat Restoration Program. So I'll talk a little bit about Irma uh, quickly before we move on. Um, I'm sure a lot of you were here for Irma potentially, or you're familiar with Irma. So I had actually just moved to Miami three weeks before Irma hit and they're like, boom, gotta go, this thing's hidden. And I was like, what? Coming from up north, I wasn't used to this. So pretty crazy, but I guess I have to be thankful for Irma because she gave me a job. So Irma, for those of you that don't know, she was a category four storm. The eye passed through the lower keys, but nonetheless, we saw significant impacts in the area. Uh, due in part because we got hit by, quote unquote, the dirty side of the storm, where the winds are moving in the same direction as the storm, and therefore the force is increased, it's additive, and there's also uh, heavy rain bands associated with this side of the storm. So again, we saw a lot of damages in the overall area and in the park. So here's some example of those damages. So on the left here, we have the before and after pictures of a spoil island. So this is an island that was filled from a dredging project. And here we actually have some native vegetation that was recently planted before uh, Irma hit. And then after the storm surge came in, the waves hit, uh, the wind came in, uh, almost all of that native vegetation was wiped out. And so we've actually done a little bit of replanting of these islands. Um, there was also some defoliation of the mangroves. Um, and if mangroves are defoliated to a certain extent, then it's very hard for them to recover. Um, they're more susceptible to mortality and they're just very stressed out. So in terms of the reefs, again, this is another before and after uh, pictures. So on the left, we have some pretty relatively healthy looking colonies of elkhorn. And then on the right, after Irma hit, these guys were sanded, sediment blasted. They were uh, had fragments broken off. Some of them could have been potentially dislodged. Um, again, the, the effects were pretty serious. So again, uh, I'll talk later actually about how we're working on this species specifically to try to restore it from the effects of Irma. So in terms of the seagrass meadows, one of the primary ways that we saw impacts from Irma is just marine debris being scattered about them. So earlier I mentioned that safety valve area um, that's kind of in the northern end of the park. So here are a string of traps that were thought to have washed in because of Irma. These are spiny lobster traps. And if the traps, which they had sat there for long enough, inevitably the seagrass underneath dies. Depending on how big that wound is, it can be very hard for the seagrass to recover. It might even take years. Um, up here on the right, you can see this line, which is associated with the traps. It actually connects the traps. And I want to mention that in particular because it can be particularly sinister, its effects, because it can drag. If another storm event comes through or another heavy wave event, again, it can move that line, tear up the seagrass even more, dig into it, cause scars, things like that. So it's really nasty stuff, and we try to get that, that out of the habitats as much as possible. And so here comes the project. So the project involves a team of six of us, plus a few others who help us out here and there. They're not fully funded, dedicated uh, to our project, but nonetheless, they help us out. And uh, with this project, we aimed to restore the ecosystems in the park 
in two ways. One, we aim to restore the affected coral populations. And then two was to remove marine debris from all the different habitats from which it was scattered. So I'll talk first about that marine debris aspect of our project. But I want to take a little step back and talk a little bit about marine debris as a whole and really emphasize that this is a global problem. This is not something that's limited to Irma, South Florida, any of that. So again, it's vastly greater than the consequences of Irma. And I think the best example of this is this picture down here on the left of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Maybe some of you guys have heard about this. So it's actually two separate garbage patches that are kind of have some intermingling of debris in between. And contrary to what a lot of people think, it's actually largely comprised of microplastics. Um, a lot of people think it's you know maybe one big patch. I think they say it's twice the size of Texas of large uh, pieces of trash that are making an island. It's actually, again, a lot, um, a lot of it is comprised of microplastics, which actually um, can be potentially worse because of the fact that it can be ingested by organisms. Um, they can cause those organisms to die. The microplastics can bioaccumulate in those organisms up the food chain. The chemicals that leach out of those microplastics can bioaccumulate up the food chain. And if perhaps we eat the organisms that have bioaccumulated these plastics and chemicals, then we could potentially ingest them, potentially uh, having negative health effects. Um, on top of that, if I've heard that in some places, these microplastics are so concentrated that the primary producers can't photosynthesize because the sunlight is blocked and therefore the whole food chain gets messed up. So great example there. Another example that probably hits closer to home, I know um, on Bill Bags and Crandon, uh, beach cleanups happen all the time. This is just a never ending problem. Trash is always washing up. And just to show that really no habitat has been spared up here in the top right, we have a picture of a plastic bag that was found at the bottom of the Marianas Trench, which is the deepest trench in the ocean. So really, this stuff's all over. And so why should we care about this issue? Well, if these pictures on the right uh, aren't enough to convince you that marine debris is a problem, I'll tell you a little bit more. So of course, there's the entanglement hazard. This turtle over here is having a real bad day. He's all caught up there. Um, you know, if he's not able to get out, get food, he could potentially die. Birds are particularly, uh, excuse me, susceptible to being entangled. Um, invasive species have the potential to move around by hitching a ride on uh, marine debris and traveling from one location to the other. And same thing for pathogens or disease causing microorganisms. They can also hitch a ride and be transferred to new areas, uh, potentially causing outbreaks. Ingestion, of course, I mentioned before that Microplastics can be eaten by organisms and bioaccumulate. Um, larger items can be ingested as well. Sea turtles are known to eat plastic bags or they've been reported to because they look like jellyfish, one of their favorite snacks. And if ingesting these things doesn't kill them automatically, it could cause illness, it could cause a blockage, decreasing their performance. In terms of damage to those benthic organisms, remember I said benthic organisms are organisms that live in, at, or near the bottom. 70% um, of marine debris actually sinks to the bottom, so benthic organisms are particularly in danger. Um, they can be, for example, down here on the bottom right, you can see a coral that's actually covered by a bag. If that coral is covered for too long, it won't be able to if the algae that lives within it won't be able to photosynthesize, make its food, it could die, and therefore uh, that structure will be lost, potentially leading to the destruction of habitat. Um, it could also just be scratched or abraded, and that could facilitate infection. It's also a boating hazard. For those of you that have boats out there, I'm sure you want to protect your investment. When we are going out to the reef or in the bay, a lot of times we'll see things floating large pieces of trash, pallets, uh, huge pilings, refrigerators we've even seen. So I'm sure none of you guys want to hit that if you got a boat. Um, visual blight, so meaning that it's just not cool to look at. Nobody wants to go to the beach and see heaps of trash on the beach. Nobody wants to go to the reef, go snorkeling and see 
fishing gear scattered everywhere or anything else. Um, nobody wants to go swimming in the ocean and be surrounded by patches of garbage. So again, it's a big issue, a lot of reasons. This is not an exhaustive list, but again, um, not good stuff. So in terms of what we find locally, a lot of the stuff that uh, you might think we find are the main culprits. So trap fishery re related debris. So the spiny lobster trap fishery, the stone crab and blue crab trap fisheries are all active in the park in the area. And so therefore we tend to find a lot of trap fishery related debris. I wanna mention that line again, because that stuff is, I keep using this word, I like it, sinister. Um, it has the potential to entangle organisms, completely rip and pick organisms up, scratch them, facilitate infection, things like that. Boating equipment, we tend to find a lot of anchors on the reef. Folks go out to the reef, anchor on the hard bottom, can't get the anchor up. And so they just cut the line thereby creating more line that's on the reef, potentially creating, again, more damage that I just mentioned. Fishing gear, of course, bait containers, fishing hooks, uh, lead weights, monofilament, again, another type of line that's particularly sturdy and can rip things up. Also hard to see, so not always the easiest to remove. Food and drink, beer bottles, aluminum cans, uh, food wrappers, things like that, that either get tossed off the boat or could fly off the boat or a lot that um, could potentially come from land-based sources too. And then on top of all that, Biscayne sits right here, generally speaking, where this red star is. And so there's a the potential for debris to be brought from all over different places to the park. And um, we do tend to find a lot of random things, some international things on the beaches, on LA Key. We often find a lot of medical equipment or uh, syringes and needles. And given where Key Biscayne is located, there could be the potential for a lot of that to wash up there too. So crazy stuff, definitely don't wanna step on that while you're out at the beach. And really I wanna, again, reiterate that Irma kind of made these issues worse, but these issues were already here. This is a huge global issue that if we don't address the sources is gonna continue to go on. And so Irma, like I said, just made it worse. It made more marine debris with the storm surge coming into the land, bringing things out, moving traps around, all that kind of stuff. So what are we doing about it? So we're getting down and dirty and we're picking up a lot of trash. So on the beaches and in the mangrove forest, basically what we do is we anchor a little bit off the shoreline. We will wade into the shoreline and then we will just start picking up trash collect it into bins. And then over here, we'll take it back to the boat. And then once the boat is at capacity, we'll bring it back to land and we'll properly dispose of it after weighing it. So you can see here, this is a big piece of machinery tire or a tractor tire, again, that we found in the mangrove. So a lot of weird stuff in there, just like I said. So next we've got seagrass meadows. And so while we're out on the reef or when we're in the mangroves, we'll pick up opportunistic debris um, that's adjacent to those habitats while we're out there. The main undertaking that we've done in the seagrass meadows was, again, that safety valve area that you saw pictures of earlier with all these traps. Excuse me. Um, we were actually able to see those strings of traps from satellite imagery on Google Earth. And we also got uh, reported uh, reports of them from boaters. So we were able to map out our route to get there because it's very shallow in this area. As you can see here, maybe less than a foot at low tide, these traps are actually exposed out of the water. And so we did some reconnaissance with uh, our team and then with the help of folks from the Miami-Dade Department of Environmental Resource Management, we were able to go out there, uh, cut the traps up, load them onto this little John boat that they had. Again, really shallow area. We couldn't bring our boat all the way in there. And so we loaded all these traps up on the boat. Again, took them back, uh, weighed everything, measured the line, and threw it all away. And I think there were over 70-some traps in these two strings. There could have been more. Certainly more out there um, that maybe we haven't found. In terms of the reefs, a little different. So we either try to hit the mooring balls or the popular dive sites in the park, or really we try to hit all the reefs. So what we'll do is we'll drop the divers in the water uh, most of the time, and then the boat will follow on the surface, follow their bubbles. Divers will collect 
debris underwater in these mesh bags. And once the bags are full, or if they get a piece that's really big, then they will attach this red thing here, which is called a lift bag. And then they will put air in it and send it to the surface, make sure it makes it all the way there. And then folks on the surface on the boat will collect it and we actually tally it, uh, process it, and then again, take it back to the shore and then dump it properly after weighing it. So here are the stats from all those operations. This is from April of last year when we started to now. So we've collected over 77,000 pounds of debris from the different habitats or almost 40 tons. You can see uh, the majority of that is accounted for the reefs, second mangroves, third is the bay, um, mainly from that safety valve operation with all those traps. And then last but not least, the beaches. And then I'll also mention that Line again, because of its potentially devastating effects, we've collected over 100,000 feet of trap related line and anchor line from the bay and reef areas. And so that's enough to stretch over more than 284 football fields. And with these numbers, although they're large, I wanna emphasize that this is not the only thing we do. This is the primary thing that we do, but we do do other things, which I'll get to later, coral restoration being one of them. And so not all of our time is dedicated to this. So definitely more out there. Um, there are also other folks in the park doing this type of work whose numbers are not reflected in these numbers. So it just goes to show how big the problem is. And you know, in my mind, I think we're just kind of skimming the surface. So now I'll jump into that second aspect of the project, which is the coral restoration aspect. And so just to give you an idea of the coral reefs in the park, over here on the right, we have a map of all the reef areas. So this light pink and dark pink, purple, whatever you want to call it, these are all the reef areas. Um, you can ignore these stars. Um, there are over 4,000 patch and bank and barrier reefs. So these little guys will be the patch reefs and these larger guys will be the bank reefs. Um, some of you might not know what a coral reef is, so I'll explain that a little bit. So a coral reef is a biogenic structure formed primarily by stony corals. So let's break that down a little bit. So biogenic meaning generated or made, bio meaning life, a living organism. And the coral reefs in the area, corals in general, are primary built or primarily built, the living organism that does it um, are stony corals. And these are corals that build a calcium carbonate skeleton with the help of the zooxanthellae or symbiotic algae that live within them, they provide the energy to the coral. So in part, they can build their skeletons and in return, the symbiotic algae get shelter from the environment. And so Florida's coral reef is home to over 45 species of stony corals, over 70 sponges, species of sponges, lots of different soft corals and algae, over 500 species of fish. So every little nook and cranny of the reef is really teeming with life. And for this reason, they've been dubbed the rainforest of the sea because of their diversity and productivity. And so why should we care about coral reefs? Well, because of the number of ecosystem services that they provide. So Coral reefs are habitat for a number of different species that we care about, including commercially important species, you know, in the area, maybe groupers, snappers that people eat, as well, the, as, well as other charismatic megafauna that people like to look at, you know, sea turtles, marine mammals that also have their place in the ecosystem. And in fact, 25% of the world's marine life depends on coral reefs at some point in their life. So coral reefs are also a source of food and income for roughly half a billion people. Again, I mentioned those commercially important species, uh, snappers, groupers in the area, spiny lobsters, um, things like that. But even more so in remote areas where folks solely depend on coral reefs for their food and income. Coral reefs also provide shoreline protection. So they have uh, wave attenuation properties so they can lower wave energy, uh, potentially lower wave height protecting coastal infrastructure, preventing erosion, um, large storm events, uh, potentially preventing flooding. Coral reefs also have the potential to house medicinal compounds, some that we haven't discovered, um, 
some uh, medicinal compounds uh, that are currently uh, being developed have been derived for, from coral reefs uh, for a number of different diseases. Coral reefs have been dubbed the medicine cabinets of the 21st century. Of course, there's the tourism and recreation benefits. There's uh, diving, snorkeling, fishing, boating, you name it. And all this combined, the economic value of coral reefs has been estimated at roughly 29 billion. But on top of all that, there's, of course, the ecological value. Um, coral reefs are, again, I said, one of the three main ecosystems we, fi we find in the park, and therefore they're an intrinsic part of that dynamic. And then in turn, the larger biosphere of the earth. And then some folks would argue that coral reefs also have an intrinsic value that you can't put a price tag on, you can't put a number on at all. And for that reason alone, they should be protected. I mean, as far as we know, coral reefs only exist on this planet in the universe and therefore for that reason again they're just worth protecting. So unfortunately despite the value of coral reefs how important it seems they are uh, coral reefs have been in a large state of decline worldwide uh, over the past few decades and so this can be attributed to a number of stressors. Um, this is not, again, an exhaustive list, but just to give you an idea, um, marine debris, we already talked about that a little bit. Its effects on coral reefs invasives, such as the Indo-Pacific lionfish, uh, eating a lot of the native fish on the reef, messing up the ecological balance, disease. There's been a large disease outbreak on the Florida reef track that actually was first observed off of Virginia Key in 2014. That's still ongoing. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Excuse me, um, climate change, the big one, and the resulting effects from that. So ocean acidification, potentially um, dissolving the reef substrata or hindering corals from their innate ability to make their skeletons by changing the ocean chemistry. Rising, rising ocean, temperatures, um, leading to coral bleaching, which I'm sure a lot of you have heard about. So this picture over here demonstrates that. So on the left, we have a beautiful coral reef. And then in the middle, we have a bleached coral reef. They have lost that symbiotic algae that I mentioned, and therefore they are starkly white because that algae also um, helps them get their color. And on the right, not too long afterwards, we have a largely dead reef, not a lot of live tissue there, covered in algae. And without some sort of intervention, this reef could just potentially erode and become a pavement. So there's also the potential uh, predicted effect of climate change of increase in frequency of strong tropical cyclones. So that is, again, another potential ramification of uh, climate change that course could um, hurt coral reefs. We're talking about Irma here and its effects to the reefs. Sunscreen has been shown to bioaccumulate in corals. Um, it can cause deformations to juvenile corals. It can cause them to bleach. Um, it can damage their DNA. Nutrient runoff, um, potentially disrupting the balance of nutrients that corals utilize to uh, take up and help them grow and uh, potentially favoring algal growth instead of um, the growth of corals. Um, groundings, of course, there's a lot of boat traffic in our area, so that is especially prevalent. Overfishing, um, of course, disrupting the ecological relationships within uh, the coral reef community. And it's estimated that 50% of reefs have died in the past 30 years, and we have the potential to lose 90% by the end of the century. So pretty grave. Um, but we are doing things about it um, to hopefully reverse that trend. And so we'll get to that in a second, but I wanna talk a little bit more about things we're seeing locally, a lot of the same. So in a way, the, our area is kind of ground zero for these issues. So to the left, you can see an injury to a coral um, from a boat striking it. So this coral, this is the live tissue over here, the living coral. This is the skeleton that is exposed from a boat hitting the coral. Up here, you can see this is a picture of that disease that I mentioned, that disease outbreak that started, or I should say, was first observed off of Virginia Key. 
in 2014 and has since spread throughout the Florida, Florida Reef Tract. Um, down here on the bottom, the Indo-Pacific lionfish. Um, the invasion was thought to have began off the coast of Miami. So again, kind of leading at ground zero. Uh, up here on the right, these are bleached corals again. There have been six major bleaching events on the Florida Reef Tract since 1987. And then down here on the right, uh, this is algae overgrowing the reef. And there's actually a paper that just came out that looked at 30 years of data and actually connected excess water runoff from the Everglades, the areas that are drained into the Everglades um, onto a Southern area of the Florida Reef Tract to coral declines in the area because of increased nutrient input. So this paper really um, suggested that water quality in the area is actually a much larger influencer of coral decline than previously thought. Um, was previously thought, you know, primarily global warming still is, but again, water quality thought to have more an effect now. And so what is the response been? So coral reef restoration has gained more traction in recent years. Um, and it's going forward with the idea that we have to do something in order to give corals hope and a future and to kind of bridge the gap before we actually address the larger issues, hopefully, like climate change, water quality, and things like that. Because if we don't do anything to intervene and help corals um, survive, really, then we could lose them. They might not be able to recover, even if the issues get solved down the line, the larger ones like global climate change. And so here I'll talk about a few methods um, that are used in restoration. So grounding repair, again, boat strikes. So this involves going out there and stabilizing that reef framework or managing the rubble that's created um, from the incident. Artificial reefs, that's another way of reef, that reefs are restored. So putting some sort of man-made object in the water so that corals can grow on them and other organisms that grow on coral reefs can grow on them. Salvaging storm damaged corals. So I'll talk more about that later. That's part of what we did. So these are corals that are just loose on the reef. Um, they've dislodged themselves or the storm has dislodged them. So we collect them and literally put them back onto the reef. Um, nursery propagation to build populations. So this involves taking coral fragments. Um, corals can re reproduce asexually by just fragmenting. And so we'll take corals and take their fragments, um, outplant those fragments on the reef, and then leave the coral from which we took the fragment there to keep growing to provide stock for more corals in the future. This is the primary, um, or one of the primary methods used by Rescue Reef. Um, maybe you guys are familiar with them. Uh, I know Dalton Hesley has given a few talks to the citizen science program in the past. And there's also larval propagation to build populations in genetic diversity. So key thing here is this is a sexual method of um, coral restoration. So what happens is folks will go out or in a lab collect coral gametes or sex cells and they will combine those gametes with those of other individuals to hopefully get successful fertilization to increase the number of corals that we are able to outplant because way more corals are produced through sexual spawning than through, than are able to be outplanted through the asexual uh, nursery propagation methods. And also to increase the genetic diversity. That's another benefit um, of the sexual methods. It's another large reason why it's done because by increasing or building the genetic diversity that's out there, there are potentially more genotypes or individuals with specific um, sets of genes that might be better prepared to handle the environmental stressors that are happening now and are predicted to potentially get worse in the future. And so I'll talk primarily about these three methods right here, because these are the methods that we're using at the park. So salvaging storm damaged corals, um, propagating corals through nursery work, things like that, and then the larval propagation methods. 
So I'll talk first about the storm damage corals and what we do with those. Um, well, we do more things with storm damage corals, but this is the salvaging method. So basically, we go out and we collect corals of opportunity into caches. And so these are corals that we opportunistically find on the reef, dislodged again, rolling around, maybe just loose. And some of them are taken to our partners who do various things with them, but most of them are attached directly to the reef again in order to create new coral communities. And so this has a number of benefits, including increasing their chance of survival. You know, they're not rolling around anymore. Excuse me. So therefore, there's less chance they're gonna die. Um, there's less potential for them to damage other corals by rolling around or other benthic organisms. It saves tougher to restore boulder corals. So boulder corals, let's see if we can find an example right here. This guy this is an example of a boulder coral. Looks like a boulder. Um, these guys are really slow growing. And so the idea is if we can save these guys that are this large already, that's the best bet than trying to grow them from babies, although that's a good idea too. Um, again, it's just the fact that they grow so slow so that it makes it, it's a best practice to save these ones that are already out there. Um, by putting species, um, by putting individuals of the same species in the same place, we facilitate sexual reproduction um, because corals, I mentioned that we collect their sex cells or gametes, corals, naturally spawn by shooting their goods into the water column and in hopes that an individual's goods from another coral will meet theirs, successfully fertilize, and then settle back onto the reef. That works great if there's a bunch of corals. If there's a situation like we have where the corals are so few and far between, odds are it probably won't happen. So by putting these corals closer together, we facilitate that natural process. And last but not least, again, this is not an exhaustive list too, but um, it enhances the reef structure uh, by creating you know, more habitat. And therefore that could potentially recruit other mobile organisms such as fish to the area. And now I'll talk a little bit about that second method um, that we're using. So building coral populations through the asexual or nursery propagation methods. So we're doing this um, with two partners. The first partner is in Dr. Diego Learman's lab at Rasmus, Rescue Reef, as I mentioned before. We're focusing on staghorn and elkhorn corals. Remember I mentioned that elkhorn way back, that before and after picture, that's one of the corals that we're working with. And so we're going out and we're helping them maintain those coral nurseries, cleaning them, fixing trees, restringing them. By the way, this is a coral tree down here, diver working on it, um, putting new trees in, uh, rearranging trees, or even putting in new trees, anchoring them down. So we help them with that. And in return, they give us some beautiful corals that we're able to outplant on the reef. So down here, you can see this is a staghorn coral that has been, has been nailed into the reef. And then up here on the right, we have some outplants a year later. Um, this is the staghorn, and then this is the elkhorn coral right here, and they're doing pretty well. So I mentioned that we do it, oh, excuse me, with two partners. And so the second partner is actually Boat Marine Lab. Um, and the process is a little different from what we do with Rasmus. And so we collect those coral gametes or those sex cells, like I had mentioned. And um, some of those actually came from elkhorn corals uh, before Irma. Um, we actually collected more gametes from another coral, the mountainous star coral after Irma, which Moat is raising in their facilities. And so they'll take them on to their land-based facilities, which they can control the environmental conditions better and they will eventually grow to a size where we can bring them back. And we will take these plugs right here, as they're called, or little discs, and we will drill into the reef substrate with an underwater drill. 
and then we will take some two-part marine grade epoxy, put it on the bottom of that plug, and then shove it in the reef in hopes that it will grow up to be big and strong. So a little bit of what that looks like. So these are the plugs on the day of outplanting. And so you can see this marine grade epoxy around them, bright and colorful. One month later, they've lost some of their color, but that's completely normal. These lighter areas over here are actually evidence of growing tissue. Uh, there's been some fish predation that has healed. Also some snail predation, we get that. But again, um, a lot of the guys are still doing pretty well. And after seven and a half months, they are starting to grow out and they have actually started growing off the reef. And I think after a month of monitoring, the later monitoring has been messed up because of COVID, but uh, we've had over 90% success with these guys. So lastly, that third method that I'll talk about is the larval propagation or the sexual methods. So again, collecting those sex cells from the corals, here's what that actually looks like. So this is the mountainous star coral that I mentioned in the previous slide, not the alcorn, not the staghorn. This is a, a large boulder coral um, that we have actually collected the sex cells from in 2019 and 2020. So this is that magical nighttime phenomenon. These are the coral goods being shot into the water column. And so, we will collect them with large nets that are draped over the coral with collection jars at the top. We'll take the jars with the sex cells, mix them um, uh, so that we hopefully get successful fertilization with different individuals. And then we will take them back to land where they will be raised in land-based facilities. So this is our little lab we had set up last year. Unfortunately, this year because of COVID, couldn't do it. So our partners have taken care of raising the babies. Um, over here, this is a picture from Moat of some of our babies from 2019. This is actually under a fluorescent microscope. This is the coral polyp. So we forgot to mention earlier, corals are colonies of uh, polyps or uh, individual organisms that coalesce together or grow out from one another, I should say. They don't coalesce. Um, so here's an individual polyp um, that is under a fluorescent microscope. Pretty cool looking. Um, again, taken to our partner organization so they can raise them. They eventually, they have the infrastructure to take, get them to the point that we need to actually put them back all, out on the reef, which will be their final destination. And so here are our stats from last year to this year. So we've planted almost 2,600 staghorn and elkhorn colonies with our partners. Um, from our spawning efforts, we've gotten 485 of those plugs last year. Remember those little plugs I mentioned that we we're drilling into the reef and putting in with over 15,000 of those mountainous star coral. So that's, again, this guy right here. Um, settles onto those plugs. Same thing, well, almost the same thing this year, over 10,000 settlers. Um, our hopes are that a lot of these guys will make it. Unfortunately, we know that uh, a lot of them won't, but our hopes is that you know, many, many will. Um, and so we hope to be able to outplant those guys in the future once they're big enough. Here are some pictures of the Elkhorn and Staghorn corals that we've outplanted. Um, this reef's looking pretty good, a lot of Staghorn there. And then over here, some pretty good looking Elkhorn. So I wanna to touch on one more thing um, that's not strictly restoration, um, but it's kind of related. And that's that disease that I mentioned earlier that we've also kind of incorporated into our project. So there's this large disease outbreak that's going on called stony coral tissue loss disease. And it was first observed um, off of Virginia Key in 2014. Like I said, it affects over 20 coral species on the Florida reef track. Remember I mentioned there's only 45 plus. It affects most of the key reef building species. So those are the ones that really contribute to building the reef. And a large portion of the ones that are susceptible get infected. So early surveys found that 66 to 100 percent of the individuals that were susceptible had the disease. And so what's particularly bad about this disease is how fast it moves and how quickly corals die if they get it. So over here on the left top, we can see this is all live coral tissue up here. Down here, this white is bare exposed skeleton where the coral tissue has recently died. So the coral has live tissue over that calcium carbonate skeleton that I had mentioned. 
And so we can see January 5th, it's about 5% dead. Two weeks later, it's about 20% dead. And just about a month later, this coral is about 60% dead. And I think an even better example is this coral down here. This coral was named Big Mama. She was over, excuse me, 330 years old or reported to be. And so she had survived the industrial revolution, heavy urbanization in the South Florida area. And within a matter of a few months, she had completely died, um, no life tissue left. So terrible, very sad. So this has been a long lasting outbreak. And um, again, started in 2014, still going on to this day, a huge geographic range. Almost all of the Florida reef tract has been encompassed and the pathogen has yet to be determined, unfortunately. So here's a graphic showing the progression of the disease, red areas being um, areas that have seen disease, green areas that haven't. So you see all the way up to 2020, only the dry tortugas area down here, which is another national park, which is 70 miles west of Key West, um, has not been affected. You can see the scans right here. Um, and again, it's gone up the Florida reef track, which stretches all the way to Martin County, and then way past Key West out here uh, in what are called the Marquesas Keys, and Rebecca Shoal. So not good, not good. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the disease in the park. So the disease initially hit in 2015. And of course, there was high mortality, like I mentioned, that is a characteristic of this disease outbreak. There's still some lingering disease in the park. And so again, we've kind of incorporated this into our project as well, related to restoration, related to Irma. Um, I don't know, may, something that may have become evident through this PowerPoint is that we are addressing the effects of Irma, but at the same time, we're also trying to address these larger issues that can be addressed by this project too. And so there's still some lingering disease in the park. And so we've incorporated a disease response um, into our project and so the best available treatment thus far is to give corals drugs or an amoxicillin paste um, that we spread on the coral lesion. So if you look up here, this is a diver applying that paste. Um, and this paste actually goes along the margin here. And it is on the border of the live tissue and the dead skeleton. And the hope is to stop that disease in its tracks right there. And in other areas of the Florida reef tract, this pace has been shown to be over 90% effective. Other treatments are being researched at the moment, um, currently not out yet. The after um, protocol for once we apply the paste is to eventually go out and monitor these corals and retreat if necessary. You guys can actually help us out so if you guys see these tags out in the water, um, there's instructions here to upload a picture of the coral and the tag to www.cfan.net slash tags. This PowerPoint um, presentation will be up on YouTube, so you can see that later if you need to. And this is a good opportunity to learn what happens next. What are the Dainese, disease dynamics like after the initial wave has passed. So in part, that's going to be figured out, or at least in part figured out too, from what we're uh, going out and observing. And so I talked a whole bunch about what we're doing, but there are also things you can do to help out park resources, even, the, even those of you who are far, far away. So in terms of marine debris, you can reduce, reuse, recycle. I'm sure you guys have heard that in the past, um, in that order, reduce the amount of waste you're creating. Unfortunately, the majority of um, marine debris originates from land, um, doing parts of poor waste management practices, stormwater um, runoff, or large natural dis disaster events. Um, if you are creating waste, reuse what you can. And last but not least, recycle. Um, not the best bet, but something is better than nothing. Anything helps. Be careful when you're out boating and fishing. Uh, make sure you have some good lookouts like these guys here. Watch out for those shallow areas in the park. We don't need any more groundings. We got enough work as is. Um, please don't anchor on hard bottom if you don't have to. We don't have to pick up more anchors. 
don't have to pick up more line. Um, take your trash with you. I'm sure all of you are very prudent about throwing your trash away, but you know, if you're on the boat, make sure trash is secure. Um, if you have other gear on the boat, like fishing rods, hats, things like that, make sure those are tucked away too. I can't tell, tell you how many beautiful fishing rods we found, uh, clothing items, spear guns, expensive stuff. So just make sure it's tucked away. Be careful if you're going out and snorkeling and diving in the park. Um, these organisms, a lot of them are very sensitive, especially corals. Uh, so you don't want to touch them, cut them, facilitate infection, things like that. So please, please be careful. Don't be like these guys, bad, bad, bad. Uh, educate others. The more that we can get this word out, spread it, of course, hopefully people will be more prudent uh, about how they uh, exercise um, themselves in the park or just elsewhere on the Florida Reef Track, anywhere in the marine environment. Do your best to reduce your carbon footprint. Again, I mentioned that we're doing restoration um, and the idea uh, behind a lot of our efforts is, you know, we just got to carry these corals over. Of course, we want to restore them just to do it, but largely we're doing this to help them bridge that gap before we address larger things like climate change. If we don't really address those, then, you know, the future of coral reefs is even more grim. And if you would like to volunteer, we have some volunteer cleanups going on, again, limited because of COVID. Uh, the volunteer program manager right here, I put her email. Again, this will be up on YouTube for you guys to get this information too, if you don't get it now. Um, the cleanups have been posted on volunteer cleanup. Um, down here, these two guys, I ha I, they haven't been, but they will be soon. Either way, any website works, right? Um, and if you have other questions about volunteering, please feel free to email Liz. Um, and again, her information will be on this, which will be on YouTube. And so that's all I got. I uh, hope you guys enjoyed, and now we'll take any questions. Hello? Okay, yeah, thank you, Jordan. No uh, problem. Thanks so Sorry. much, Jordan. No problem. I'm going to see on Twitter if we got any questions. Sounds good. Oh, wait, um, OK, yeah, so um, while Bree is looking at that, I will start out. I have a few questions. OK. First, I just want to make a comment. Like, so obviously you're a marine biologist. I'm trained mm -hmm. as a marine biologist, and mm -hmm. um, so is Bree. And it's um, it's it's weird when you get into marine biology. You don't expect that a huge um, portion of the job is going to be trash collecting, <laughs> but but that really sure. is like a really you know huge part of it. Absolutely. Um, it's uh yeah it's it's kind of funny like you don't you don't expect that yeah i mean i didn't think when i was going to get my masters that i would be a underwater garbage man but <laughs> at this point in time that's what it is um yeah yeah definitely so, but, i mean again that just shows that how big this problem is you know that you know all of us kind of know about this and are kind of involved in it you know maybe that's not your main gig but you know you could I'm sure everybody hears about beach cleanups. Like I said, build bags, crane in, you name it. I mean, it always happens because it's such a huge problem. So really it's just a testament to how big the issue is. Right. And it's yeah. a great introduction to next month's talk. So we'll be talking more <laughs> about trash next month. Tune in, uh, everybody. Definitely. Cool so, so the first question that I have for you, um, yeah. I'm not involved, but, um, so I read that the seagrasses in Biscayne Bay were dying because uh, humans have messed with or changed the uh, water flow or the water movement. Mm -hmm. um, do you see a lot of that when you're doing your work in Biscayne Bay? And did Irma affect or contribute to that problem? Um, so I'll say that my team actually doesn't go out and measure, you know, um, seagrass cover, things like that. So I'm not 100%. Sure. Um, I know that there was a talk by Dr. Diego Learman not too long ago that really addressed this problem. Um, I, I could point you in the direction of that because literally, I mean, this, that would answer all your questions right then and there. Um, I, I think that the moral of the story was from, I didn't actually watch it, but my coworkers did that. It's actually doing 
better than maybe thought. Um, in terms of the effects from Irma, like I said, primarily the, the thing we saw was just marine debris being scattered about all these different habitats. I mean, that was, again, the main thing. Um, so I don't know, hopefully that answers your question. Again, I can point you to the other link um, for the seagrass thing. I mean, the, all encompassing right there. Like I said, we are not measuring that stuff. So I'm not 100% sure. Okay. Uh, Bree, do you? I don't see anything on Twitter tonight. Um, okay. Again, uh, those in the audience, you can tweet us. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it's up there on the screen. If you have any questions, email me or, or tweet at us and uh, we'll go ahead and answer them. Also, I said in the beginning that we are not using the chat function and I was wrong about that. So feel free to write questions in the chat function of Zoom. I saw a little chat pop up. I was like, what do I do? Yeah, there is yeah. something. So oh, I guess I'll read it out loud because, you know, yeah, yeah, I can. Uh, for Jordan, of course, is moxicillin at, uh, is this just an explanation of it? As amoxicillin is an effective treatment is the pathogen of stony coral disease suspected to be bacteria and origin. Sorry, I was reading ahead of myself. <laughs> You're good. I feel like I know where this is going, but. That's anyway. the question, so. Yeah, oh, is okay. amoxicillin so, effective as, uh, or do you suspect that it's bacteria basically? Uh, so like I said, um, other folks within the region have shown that the um, amoxicillin paste is over 90% effective um, for certain corals and we don't exactly know the pathogen yet. We know that a bacteria is involved and obviously because the corals respond well to the amoxicillin treatment, but we're not sure. It could be that um, a virus is the cause, for example, and then afterwards a bacteria just so happens to infect and cause uh, like all the real negative ramifications. So we don't know if it's the causative agent, the single only thing, um, it could be that there are a number of different pathogens involved, one of them being a bacteria. And by treating that bacteria, that like again, I, I had said, actually has shown pretty positive results. So we don't know oh, yet. So basically <laughs> you're saying that they could be infected and weakened by a bacteria and then that leaves room for, or sorry, uh, by a virus and that leaves yeah bacteria to then infect them and, and like cause the victim. right yeah exactly it, more susceptible exactly cool i mean not cool but interesting. right or there could be some other dynamic though we don't know i mean really <laughs> again it, it's it's really hard to from what i've heard isolate the pathogen and so it, it's tough but there is ongoing research in this field because i mean this is huge i mean this is like tearing the florida reef tract up so I mean, yeah. a lot of, I believe a lot of efforts have been put into attention to isolate. So, so my next two questions, I'm going to ask them together because they're kind of related. Okay. It's, you mentioned finding refrigerators, plural, <laughs> in the park. Do you have any information on what other kinds of crazy things have been found as trash? So that's one question. I and knew this was coming. <laughs> that I had is what kinds of international trash do you find? Um... Let's see. Uh, okay, so weird things. Like I said, a lot of like syringes and needles, some medical supplies on the beaches, uh, refrigerator. I feel like we found at least two. Maybe it's just one. That tractor tire tire was unexpected. <laughs> That's pretty gnarly. There's, I, mean, I guarantee, you there's more of those in the mangroves. There's a lot of weird stuff in the mangroves. A lot of stuff that is pre Irma. Who knows how long it's been there? That's just sitting in there so lots of other tires we found a jet ski a whole jet ski in the mangroves um oh what a waste of money i know it's so weird uh uh oh, i'm sure i'm sure nobody wanted to lose that it just so happened that they did um dog kennels we found two dog kennels on the reef on the reef so one uh, the folks from another team found a dog kennel on the reef we found one so that's pretty crazy. Um, man, I'm trying to think. In terms of international debris, like a lot of like food wrappers and food containers, things like that that you know are from other countries, just because of the language on it. Um, 
I mean, it could be from here too, of course. There are places that sell that stuff here, but uh, potential for it to have come from other countries as well. So mainly, mainly that type of stuff. Um, it's hard to tell, but other things have come from other countries. So it's all just yeah. kind of general. But so mainly, I would Alrighty. say that. Alrighty. Well, I think that we are ten minutes over. Uh, oh. So unless there are any pressing uh, last minute questions, I, I actually I do have one one question that just came in through email last question right. um so it says you can you mentioned you could see the strings of lobster traps using google earth okay. how how long can those be like I, I guess they're asking like what what length of traps are normally set or like what are, what do you find hmm, that's a good question um like normally how long they can be i mean it, it can vary i mean there could be or just maybe what what you found like oh, man. i like, wish i, I i'm bad at estimating lengths like that especially from aerial imagery um but maybe if, I'm just, few, like, if it's aerial imagery i would imagine that they're pretty long if you can see them from yeah i mean they, they were i mean i would say a few hundred feet at least um the, i mean these were like i said at least 30 plus traps in each string. Each trap is like four feet by three feet and then connected by line. So, I mean, it was, I would say at least a few hundred feet, maybe more. And that's each one. Wow. That's that's a lot. It is, it is. All right. And that's just there on the reef too. There's a lot more. Anyway. Oh, I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure there's tons more. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, so as Brie mentioned, we are a few minutes over, but thank you everybody for staying this long and I hope you guys enjoyed it. Uh, thank you very much, Jordan, for speaking with us today. Thank you, Brie, for your help. Um, if anything comes up that you're curious about and you still have questions, you can feel free to email me and I can, you know, forward them to Jordan and, and let you know. Um, and again, as I mentioned in the beginning, today is Give Miami Day. If you'd like to support us and, and help us with, you know, continuing this kind of programming and expanding our programming, we would be very grateful if you would pledge at uh, givemiamiday.org slash citizen scientist. Thank you guys very much. Thanks and have a great night. All right. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Have a good one. Jordan. <laughs>